Does this yeah. work? Perfect. Because I'm just, just looking through the list of people who are here. Um, and uh, I, I think we have, a, we have a reason. Am I correct in saying there's a reasonably diverse audience? We have some clinicians, people from clinical background, and then extreme solid mechanics experts like Jose and Francesco. Uh, so I was just explaining to uh, Sebastian and Ed at the start when we, were, when we were waiting that I found it very, very challenging to know how to structure this presentation, you know, given that I'm trying to speak to people from a clinical background and also to leading international experts in continuum mechanics. Uh, so I'm going to try and bridge that gap. And I, I, I was trying to think of a title, a title for the presentation and uh, torn between two titles, so I said I'd use both of them. I, the first title is Why Finding Element Modeling of Biological Material is So Difficult. And uh, secondly, from, I suppose really want to go and try to do my second title is From the Basic Concept of Finding Element Modeling to Active Biomechanical Behavior of Living Tissue. So I, I'm, I'm going to start off uh, the lecture really on where, where Jose finished the last day. Uh, you know, Jose did a fantastic job trying to give a, a general introduction to final element modeling. And I'm sure anybody who uh, who's not from an engineering background will say it's impossible to understand final element modeling in, in a one hour lecture. It's impossible to find, even, you know, even in six months, it's impossible to understand final element modeling unless you really go to an engineering undergraduate. And then I would claim that people coming out of an engineering undergraduate don't understand final element modeling. They, they have a, you know, a, a sense of what it is, maybe a sense of the theory, a sense of how to use some software. You, I think I firmly believe you need to do a PhD and then you know, maybe postdoc and before you can truly say that you're an expert in final element modeling. Um, would you agree, Francesco, with this statement? Or Jose? I think we anybody who has worked in final element will will agree that this is the case. So just just to give a very sense of a very you know quick sense of the complexity of final element modeling. So here I have a uh, so the whole point of this slide is that if you if you you know if you haven't done an undergraduate module in under in final element modeling, you know it's impossible to understand it. So <laughs> I'm trying to. Explain the slide in the sense that the slide is not explainable if you, if you don't already know what it is. This, this is a thing called a strain tensor here. In two dimensions, we have three components of strain. Strain is like a deformation. Uh, so we can stretch the material in the X direction and that would give us a, you know, a strain in the X direction. We can stretch the material in the Y direction vertically. That will give us a deformation. This, it's a measure of deformation, how much we're stretching the material in the Y direction. And then this, this is the shear, right? gamma X, Y. It's how much the shape is changing essentially. In, in the next y plane. And then you might say, what, what, what is this uh, nasty looking thing here? Uh, so this, this is uh, you know, basically, a, <laughs> this is how you relate the, the displacement. So if you imagine a, an element and the element has some nodes or corners, these corners are moving in space and they might move by a distance in the x direction and a dis distance u in the x direction and a distance v in the y direction. Uh, and each node is moving a different amount, starting from node i and going up to Okay, and then this 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 is basically a thing called a shape gradient, a shape a shape function gradient matrix. So these these ends are basically functions that distribute these displacements in space. And if we take the gradients of these spatial distributions, we we get you know a numerical representation of the distribution of the strain. Basically, and again, this might sound if you're not familiar with this, you say oh, I have no idea what he's talking about. And if you say I have no idea what he's talking about, then I've achieved my goal because I'm trying to trying to show here that this is very very difficult to understand. Yeah, um, and then you know we we also you know we we construct a, a potential function um, relating external forces to basically the internal uh, the internal energy of the system, and if we minimize this. We we get what's basically the you know the familiar final element equation. That, that says that this stiffness matrix here 
multiplied by the displacements, the known, the unknown nodal displacements, uh, will be equal to the applied force vector. Uh, and when we can write, we can write this in discrete form per node. This k, uh, this is this is a basically a fourth order matrix. Uh, this is this is our uh, displacement vector a vector of the unknown displacements of the no, of the element, uh, and this is a vector of the forces that are applied to the nodes of the element. Um, and when we write this in matrix form, we get this very complicated looking thing. And this is just for one element. Uh, so this, so, um, and then if you're a clinician, you you probably, especially if you work on an assist, you'll be looking, you'll be used to looking at Julia in particular and Sarah and you know, Jose Francesco, maybe from Galway as well. These spectacular looking, spectacular looking fine element uh, meshes that we constructed through working with EMC and AMC, Pranita and Tank can add, you know, basically we worked very closely with them to convert these medical images into these fine element meshes. And, you know, the pictures look impressive, sure. Um, but what are you really looking at here? You're looking at, you know, a series of interconnected elements. Uh, and each single element is governed by an equation that looks something like this. And then we have to join all these elements together. And even if I'm just joining two elements together, I'm basically assembling a thing here called a, a global stiffness matrix. So imagine if there's just two triangles instead of millions of triangles, like I've shown here. So even for two triangles, we have to we have to understand how these these triangles are connected and make sure we line up the uh, the components of each row and each column correctly. So it's describing how how this triangle is connected to this triangle in terms of its node numbers. It it's bloody tricky. Uh, it takes it takes a long time. Even even if you write down the solution for just two elements, it takes you know a long time and you know to, to solve something like this, to construct a model like this, and get these pretty pictures from it. Eventually, this is the output. And the problem is, if you're a clinician, you're you're used to just looking at these kind of outputs. We see you know we see these kind of meshes coming from medical images, and then we see these outputs with lots of colors. This is the principal. Uh, I think this is principle of strain in the in the in the vessel uh, geometry. This is in a paper that we just submitted to the special issue. Or you can also do a, a fluid dynamic simulation where we're, where we're simulating the movement of uh, fluid through the mesh. Um, and uh, you know, you'll have seen Bastian and, and uh, Stephen present lots of fluid mechanics simulations with spectacular plots of flow and uh, transport of particles, etc. Uh, and this is a this is what we call a fluid structure interaction, where we have a, a flow going through a vessel, and we also have a deforming vessel wall that that basically undergoes deformation due to due to straining or due, due to the pressure and the the shear the wall shear stress is applied by the fluid, and we have a clot lodged here, and we can calculate things like how much pressure is on the clot, what's the stress state in the clot. But all of these all, all of these you know impressive looking pictures. Underline all of it is you know these really nasty looking matrix equations that you know our you know our software assembles and solves you know over hundreds of thousands of elements and there's so much depth and you know riches of development thousands of man years of finite element development going into these codes that you know it's it's really difficult to appreciate it if you're coming from a clinical background so. So immediately uh, at the start of my lecture, I'm, 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 I'm already saying I'm, I'm, I'm admitting complete failure. I, I can't hope to, if you're a clinician uh, or from a clinical background, I can't hope to give you a, a, a deep understanding of this. But what I, what I do hope to do for the next you know, 30 minutes or so is help, help you to, when you see a picture like this or you see a mesh, you, 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 can, you, can, you can have some sense of the challenge of, of how do you make a model like this? And, and in particular, for biological materials, for, for describing the, be, the behavior of a biological material in a finite element model, what, what are the important things? And if you're talking to an engineer, or you know, if, you're, if you start to collaborate with someone who claims to be an expert in finite element modeling, and they model everything as, you know, if they, if they say, oh, we're modeling everything as linear elastic, you know, don't, don't be fooled by this because, you know, this is basically fine element 101 if you're modeling everything as linear elastic. And it, it usually is not appropriate for 
any kind of biological system undergoing you know, significant deformations, for example, arteries, medical devices, we, we, we should be thinking about more complicated material behavior. So that, that's kind of the background motivation for this, uh, for this talk. I'm trying, that's basically a, a sense of what I'm hoping to achieve. Uh, and uh, um, hopefully, you know, if, if you don't already have deep understanding of fine elements, you won't, you won't have a deep understanding after this lecture, but hopefully you'll be able to say, oh, okay, I have a better sense of where, where these color pictures come from. Um, and the kind of work it takes to develop these color pictures. So, so back to our you know, basic equation that, that Jose presented last week. So this, this, these are our, our, um, our gradient uh, matrices from the shape functions, the D matrix basically. This D matrix here is the, is the matrix that describes the material. So if you're making a finite element model of something that's made from steel, this D matrix will be very different to the same finite element model that's that's claiming to model, you know, maybe a piece of plaque in an artery or you know a, a piece of a polymer. So this this D basically, this matrix D here describes the material that you're modeling. And the simplest, the, like I said, the very simplest D matrix is basically a, a linear elastic material where, where E is the Young's modulus. Now, if you're a clinician, you'll have you probably have heard of Young's modulus. You know, not sure how, how precise an understanding you have of what a Young's modulus is or how, how scary you find this matrix. Uh, I know that uh, all the guys in Milano are looking at this saying, okay, this is, yeah, I learned this in, you know, first year engineering, uh, no, six years ago, or may, maybe more than six years ago in some cases for Francesco and Jose, maybe, maybe I won't say how many years ago, but we all have, we all have encountered this and maybe it looks a little bit intimidating, but this, you know, we can understand, we can, I think everybody can hope to understand this. So this, this is the Young's, this is, E is the Young's modulus and sigma is the stress and, and epsilon is the strain. So basically this D matrix is relating the stress to the strain. So let, let me try and explain to a clinical audience what, what, where we get this kind of information. So you've seen in lots of you know, our presentations from Work Package 4, we're presenting you know, these really complicated simulations from Julia, you know, thrombectomy simulations with clots rolling and interacting with thrombectomy devices, etc. And you'd also have seen that we, 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 you know, with Neuravi and then UI Galway and then Milano, we've done a lot of experiments on the material, on the clot material. And it, it, this experimentation is, is key. You can't do, you can't build a good finite element model without doing some experimentation. And the idea with the experimentation, you know, the model is very complicated. We must try and make the experiment as simple as possible to try and understand the material. Uh, so the typical experiment is, is called a uniaxial tension test. So this is, this is a test machine. So uh, Basically, you know, if you go to any engineering lab in any university in the world, you see lots of machines like this. So this is a this is a clamp on the top, and this is a clamp on the bottom. This clamp on the bottom is fixed. This clamp on the top is attached to this crosshead, and this this there's a, usually a motor that moves this crosshead up, upwards if you're doing tension, or downwards if you're doing compression. And there's a load cell here which is measuring the force, and then you know that this machine is measuring how much distance we're moving up by. So basically. If we're doing a tension test, we cut our, we, 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 we formulate a, a sample, a test sample, what we call a test, a test sample in what's called a dog bone shape. You can see why it's called a dog bone shape. It's like a, the shape of a bone that you give to your dog to eat. Uh, so these, these rectangular pieces on the ends are to just attach to these grips. And then we have this long slender part in the middle, which is really the part of the material that we're testing. Um, and from that, we get a, we get a stress strain curve. Now I'm going to, and I really apologize to all the engineers in the audience because this is too simple, but let me, just, uh, let me just try and explain to the clinicians where this, uh, where this stress strain curve is coming. Uh, I'll just open a, a paint window here. So let's, let's say we have our, our specimen. This is a piece of uh, any material. Should be here, yeah. Sorry guys, I'll start that again. This is a piece of material, uh, keep the drawing simple. So we put this into the machine and the, the machine will, for example, stretch the material. So it becomes longer. 
And if it has an original length, the original length of the material is L0. And if we imagine it's a circular cross section, and this circular cross section has an area A0 at, at the start of the test. Okay, and then we stretch the material. So the length, the length of the material now becomes L0, which is the original length, plus delta L. And when we stretch the material, remember I said there was a load cell on the, on the machine, and the load cell is measuring the amount of force that it's taking to, uh, to stretch the material. So the stress, what we call the nominal stress or the engineering stress, usually written as sigma, but you know, this, this basically is the force divided by the area of the specimen, F over A0, okay? And the string is the change in length of the material over, over the original length of the material. Okay, so when engineers start to talk about what is stress, what is strain, this is what they're, they're talking about. The, the, the stress is like the, the force, but it's normalized by the area of the material because it, it wouldn't, why, why, do we this, why do we do this normalization? Uh, well, because if we make the material thicker, of course, it'll take more force to stretch it. So we're not learning anything by doing that. Uh, so what we do is we normalize the force by the area. So we're, we're figuring out essentially how much force per unit area does it take to stretch the material by a distance delta L. Um, and uh, for the strain, it's basically the percentage of deformation. Uh, so what percentage do we increase this, the length of the bar by? So basically, when we do a test, the machine is measuring the force and the change in length. And if the material is what we call linear elastic, we get a, a, a linear change between the force and the length, okay? If we divide this force then by the area and the length by the change in length, we can convert this force displacement diagram into a stress strain curve, which will also be linear. If this is linear, this must be linear because all we're doing is dividing this by a constant on this axis and by a constant on this axis, okay? so. That, that's how we get the stress strain behavior. And the slope of this line is the Young's modulus. Okay. So this is the, this is the equation that I was showing you a few minutes ago. This is a 2D version of the equation. We, we, we should really write this in 3D. Uh, and in 3D, we, have, we can stretch the material in the X direction, Y direction, or the Z direction. And then we can change the shape. We can shear the material in, in three planes as well. Um, so when we do a uniaxial test, when we, when we do this test, what are we doing? We're basically deforming the material. So we only have one component of stress. In this case, we're stretching in the Y direction. So we only have a, a component of stress in the Y direction. But that's enough to allow us to measure the Young's modulus. And if the material is what we call isotropic, if the, if the material behaves in the same way, and it, regardless of whether we stretch in the X, Y, or Z direction, then we can get the Young's modulus and we can also get the Poisson's ratio. The Poisson's ratio is how much the, it's essentially like a, a measure of how incompressible the material is, but what it really is, is how much the material contracts, how much, it, how much the area becomes smaller as we stretch the material. So as we all know, when you stretch this material, we would expect the area to become smaller. Um, and uh, that's what the Poisson's ratio is. So if we can understand the material behavior in a one-dimensional test. So this is like a one-dimensional test. This allows us to, to basically model the material behavior in a complicated three-dimensional setting. Okay, now the problem with this linear elastic material, if we get a behavior like this for the material, there, there are two things. It, 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 we can only use this kind of behavior if the material is truly behaving as a linear material. And also uh, if, if the deformations are very small. So when we think about applications where we want small deformations, usually you know one, one broad area where we're looking for small deformations, and I think Jose showed plots like this last week, uh, these are civil engineering structures. When a civil engineer makes a, you know, designs a building, he wants small deformations. When you, when you design something like this, uh, like this impressive building, 
you, you, you don't want large deformations, especially if you're sitting in the top restaurant here. Uh, so these linear elastic material behaviors are fine for civil engineering applications like modeling concrete beams or steel beams where we don't want big deformations. Um, but as the final element me method developed over the decades, a huge focus was put on plastic deformation or large deformation. Um, and this was very much driven by the, by the automotive industry. So here we see some final element models of, of crash, uh, of crash simulations of a truck crashing or a car crashing. And underneath this, I have a, a picture here of a stent. Now, what do these things have in common? Well, basically, they all involve plastic deformation. Um, and this is, a, this is the next step up in complexity of material behavior. So, so what is plastic deformation? I'm just going to just I, I think everybody should know what a stent is, but I'm just going to play a, a simple demonstration video here. Uh, can, can you see this, guys? Uh, but this is just a, a YouTube video. You see many of them on YouTube. So basically, in a stent, you, you have a metal cage on a, on a balloon. The balloon is inflated. Uh, this opens up the metal cage. Um, back again. Apologies. So we, we introduce the stent to a blockage in the artery. It's usually made from stainless steel. The balloon opens, opens the stent, then the balloon deflates and the stent stays in position. And this is because the stent has undergone a thing called permanent plastic deformation. And th these, when, when a car crashes as well, we have permanent deformation in, in these crumple zones. And the idea is that, you know, the, the great thing about this, the, the important thing about plastic deformation here is it absorbs a lot of energy. That's why, why when engineers are designing cars and trucks using the final element method, they want to, induce a lot of plastic deformation in these zones here because this, this absorbs the energy, which is, which is good, the energy of a crash, which is protecting the people inside the car. Uh, in a stent, we want plasticity for a different reason. We want plasticity so that when we take away the balloon, the stent is staying in place. So this is our, basically our, 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 our this is what happens to our stress strain relationship when we introduce plasticity. And this is just basically putting this as simply as possible. Basically, it becomes pretty complicated. Uh, it, our, our simple matrix that we have up here for linear elasticity with just the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio becomes quite complicated. And also, you might notice that we have d sigma and d epsilon. Basically, we need now incremental solutions because the material behavior is nonlinear. So what happens with plastic deformation? So usually for plastic deformation of materials like stainless steel or cobalt chrome that we use in stents, uh, we, we have elastic plastic behavior. So the material starts off as elastic. So if I have a, a piece of material and I start to stretch it, I eventually reach what's called a yield point. And if I continue to deform it, it doesn't take as much stress to uh, continue the deformation. Now, the key point is, if I unload the material, it unloads parallel to its Young's modulus. So when we get back to zero stress, when I take all the load off the material, it doesn't return to its original shape. If anybody has a paper clip beside them, you can just try, you know, we all know instinctively, if we take a paper clip and we unbend the hinge of the paper clip, it doesn't spring back to its original shape because we perform plastic deformation. And this allows us to decompose the deformation into an elastic part, which is recoverable. In other words, the spring back and the plastic part, which is non-recoverable. Okay, so the fact that we can, we can understand this plastic deformation allows us to model things like stents um, and allows us to model things like uh, simulating the, 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 the crashing of, of, of cars. And just, just, just to give people in the clinical arena a sense of how important this fine element modeling is for, uh, for these industries. Um, 
car manufacturers don't perform crash tests at all anymore. Uh, or at least the vast majority of them do not. We, we, we're all used to seeing, you know, ads on TV where you see a, you know, a car, a, a car test dummy in a, in a physical car and they, you know, shows the car driving against the wall and measuring the forces on the dummy. Only, only the testing bodies are actually doing this. The car manufacturers don't do this. Why not? They don't do this because their final element models are so accurate. They don't need to waste money crashing cars. They can, they can simulate exactly what happens during a crash because of all this development of final element analysis and plasticity modeling over many decades. Um, so this is a huge cost saver and allowed, it's, it's basically allowed design of, of, of automotive cars and trucks to change dramatically over recent decades. Um, and anybody who's worked in stent design will know that regulatory bodies like the FDA in the US insist that you must do a final element analysis, an elastic plastic final element analysis of a stent before you can get regulatory approval for, for a new stent design. So this fine element analysis that, that I'm showing here for this, you know, for example, here I'm showing a stent in this crimp state and then it's deployed. Uh, we see these very large deformations in the stent. So you see the deformations are huge compared to, again, I refer back to civil engineering, where we don't have big deformations in these structures uh, and we use linear elasticity. For, for stents, we have huge deformations. We go from this shape to this shape, lots of permanent deformation, lots of plasticity. And the regulatory bodies insist that if any company submitting a new stent design must perform final element analysis. You can't get approval without it. And we also use final element analysis for things like fatigue, um, fatigue analysis, not just predicting will the stent fracture during the deployment, but also will the stent be safe for 10 years in the body, et cetera. So again, this is just you know, another example of how final element analysis and non-linear material modeling has transformed the industry and allow these products to be designed uh, in a safe way. And it, this, this in turn has completely changed how we treat heart disease in the, in, in the world. So this, this is a great example of, of engineering and clinical practice coming together to revolutionize an industry, in my opinion. Okay, another material behavior that's important for large deformations is, is called hyperelasticity. And this is where we we get large deformations of, of a material, but it's not permanent. If we take away the load, we go back along the same curve. And we, so, so basically in plasticity for metals or stents, you know, we, we, if we go along this curve and we get to this point, we unload along this curve here. We don't go back along the path that we start. But for, for lots of other materials, we can undergo very large deformations. In other words, we're going up to very high strains of 40% here um, in a very non-linear way. And then if we unload, we go back along the same path. And this, this kind of behavior is called hyperelasticity. You'll have heard us talk about hyperelasticity in lots of our presentations and insist. And a lot of this kind of modeling has come, has been motivated by, again, by the automotive industry and the aerospace industry, particularly modeling things like rubber tires for cars or airplanes or rubber seals for various, uh, various components of machines. Um, and, Usually in this kind of modeling, if, you're, if, you're, if anyone is familiar with hyperelastic modeling or if you're a clinician and, and you're, you're sitting through a presentation that maybe uh, Beruz might give or Francesco, you might see equations like this. And this is basically just, uh, this is called a strain energy density function. And this is basically saying if, if, we, if we deform the material a little, you know, by a certain amount, how much energy are we storing, are we storing in the material? Um, and we can then get the stress strain relationship to a kind of a complicated piece of calculus that I've shown here that I won't even attempt to explain. Either, you know, either you're familiar with this or you're not. But basically the, the mathematics becomes more complicated now. We, we can't just use this you know, simple matrix to describe the material. It, it, th things become quite complicated and nonlinear. Um, and the relationship between stress and strain becomes very nonlinear. So, so, so this is where I'm going to pick up because this, this transitions into some of the work that we've done at the start of INSYST to try and understand the behavior of clots. And basically working with Beruz, we, we developed, um, we've developed what we call an isotropic hyperelastic models. And this is kind of 
motivated by some by models that have been developed in the last 20 years for arteries. So, like I said, we have to perform fine element analysis for stents to get approval for new stent devices. So this has led to you know, new suites of models to describe how arteries behave. And this, this modeling, this model development has been mostly driven by Gerhard Holzefeld, who many of us are familiar with and lots of us have worked with. And, and basically it's an acknowledgement that if you look at an artery, it's got all these fibers, mostly collagen fibers and some elastin fibers in it. So this is a schematic of an artery. Here we see the endothelial layer here. Um, and then we have the, the media, which is basically smooth muscle cells and some collagen fibers. And then in the adventitia, we, we have fibroblasts and also collagen fibers at different angles. If we do a confocal image, we can see that these fibers are made, you know, usually aligned in a layer specific way. So the strategy, the, the, the big advance here with modeling soft tissue compared to a piece of rubber. So in, in these traditional rubber models that were developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s by people like Ray Ogden, uh, th th these models are usually isotropic. And what does isotropic mean? Isotropic means if I stretch it in the one direction or the X direction, I get the same response if I stretch it as I get if I stretch it in the two direction or the three direction. In other words, the material doesn't really have an aligned microstructure. Every, every direction in the microstructure is similar, but that's not the case for this artery. If I stretch it in the radial direction in this direction here, I'm, I'm getting a very different response to if I, if I try and expand its circumference. So the kind of deformation that I do, that I do on an artery will determine its, its behavior. And the strategy usually for modeling arteries is to decompose the deformation into a matrix part, which is describing a, an isotropic matrix. In other words, the, the, the material between these fibers uh, and then separately modeling the fibers and adding the two contributions together. Now, because clots, blood clots also have fibers in them. Usually, you know, blood clots have a fiber network rather than a collagen network like we get in an artery. We felt that we could use a similar strategy for blood clots in MSIS, that we, we would basically decompose the blood clot into a, a matrix part, which represents things like red blood cells or, um, you know, the non-fibrous parts of the clot, and then the fiber network. But we discovered quite quite soon that when when you start to do this decomposition, you run into all kinds of complications. So, for example, if you go into abacus, uh, if anybody, I, I guess this we're moving into slightly complicated details here. So maybe clinicians might have to just bear with me a small bit over the next few slides. Um, I'll try and try and explain the basis of what I'm saying, but I'll. I'll I'm going to maybe move slightly the presentation slightly in the direction of the engineers for a few minutes. Uh, if you go into if you go into Abacus, for example, and you you try and use the, an isotropic hyperelastic model in Abacus, which basically says we have fibers in a in a matrix, and you do a uniaxial test. So I'm going to going to play this again. What you find is when you stretch the material in this x direction, it expands outwards in in the y and the z direction, which is completely unphysical. And there, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a slight bug in the cold, uh, which comes from the fact that the, the volumetric deformation is not being removed from the stretch, the I4 stretch tensor. So when we, when we fix this, we, we basically get a, we get a correct, well, a more correct representation of the deformation. We fixed the problem in, in one direction here, but we're getting this expansion in, in the second direction which again, we don't see in our, in our experiments. So we, as part of insist, we decided to try and understand why, why does this happen? Why, why are we getting this, this expansion in this direction when we use these models of fibers and soft tissue? So, so this is work that, that uh, Beruz has done as part of insist. So if we take this, this block of material and we say we have two fibers connected to this matrix, the fibers are at an angle theta. When we stretch this block of material in, in the horizontal direction here, you can see these fibers are starting to become more aligned. But what we, we're, we're, when we stretch the material, we're stretching the fibers. And this puts tension into the fibers. So if the fibers reach an angle theta, 
we, we have a tension in the fiber that we can decompose into a Y component of tension and an X component of tension here. Now this X component is just a measure, it, it just basically is, is measured as difficulty to stretch the material in the X direction. But what, the, what this Y component of tension does is it tends to pull the material inwards. Why is that happening? Well, when I, when I stretch the material in the X direction, the Y direction should be a stress-free direction. In other words, there's no boundary condition on this Y surface here, on this, on this front surface. So there should be no stress on this surface. So if this is the, the, the two direction, um, the, the Y direction, that means the matrix and the fibers stress component should be in equilibrium. They, they, should, they should sum to zero. And the same in, in the three direction. Okay, so, so why is, why, why, what's happening here? Well, basically the fibers are very nonlinear. So usually when a fiber is not under stress, it's got this wavy configuration. If we look at, you know, SEM images of the fiber network, we can often see waviness in the fibers. And then as we stretch them, we start to straighten out the waves. But when we straighten out these undulations, these waves, the material becomes stiffer. We can see this nonlinear increase in the stiffness. And eventually it becomes fully straight. And we say then that it reaches this, um, this large deformation stiffness. So what's happening here? Well, basically the fiber develops an extremely high stress because of this nonlinearity. So that means that in this plane, in the two direction, in the Y direction, the matrix must perform a very large compression so that we can satisfy this equilibrium equation. So that means if the fiber is developing a very large tensile component in the Y direction, that means to satisfy this stress-free boundary condition, the matrix must develop a very large negative compression. So that means the matrix becomes very compacted in this Y direction. And this then forces the matrix to expand outwards in the third direction. So why is this happening? Because the fiber becomes a lot stiffer than the matrix. So if we model the matrix as being linear and the fiber as being nonlinear, then we get these non-physical expansions. And this is called auxetic behavior, where when we stretch the material, it expands outwards. So we proposed, in addition to a, a strain stiffening fiber, uh, as we also proposed that we should use a strain stiffening matrix material where we control the stiffness of the matrix to increase as a certain proportion of the stiffness of fiber. And when we do this, we get a very good representation of the material behavior. So, so we test the material in, in two directions, in the X direction and in the Y direction, we get two different stiffnesses and we're capturing, so we're capturing basically the anisotropy of the material behavior. In other words, we're, we're showing that the material is stiffer in one direction than in the other direction. But more importantly, we're not getting expansion in the Y direction. We're getting a compression in the Y direction, which is exactly what we expect to see from our experiments. Okay. This, is, this is quite a busy slide, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this slide here. Um, and and uh, this, this behavior, this, this correct behavior that we're getting with our new model, we don't see this uh, when we use the traditional models that are currently available in finite element codes like Abacus and ANSYS. Okay, we, we use this model for blood loss, like I said, and we, we perform compression of, of blood loss, uh, as I'm showing here, and we get this very nonlinear compressive behavior. And we also measured the volume change during this compression, and we got a, got a very nonlinear volume change. And we showed that our new model can capture this nonlinear volume change very well. Um, and this allowed us to, you know, working with Ray and uh, at Ray and Anu and Sarah at their Abbey, we were able to simulate experiments where we put plots into tapered tube, into, into a tapered tube, and we're able to predict how far the clot will move in the tapered tube before it becomes occluded as a function of the clot properties. Uh, and so, so we got a good match with the experimental data for this. And then we went on to simulate how far the clot moves in a, in a subject specific vessel before it becomes occluded. And what's the, straight, what's the stress state in the clot at the point of occlusion? 
Okay, so the next step in, in this model development is we want to include some plasticity, some permanent deformation uh, into our blood clot model. And th this really is where things become complicated. We're so far away now from talking about a Young's modulus, it's crazy. You know, so uh, what, what we're trying to capture here, so just to try and make a link between engin the engineering aspect of this and, uh, and the clinical aspect. Um, there, there's good evidence that if you deform a blood clot a lot, for example, if you remove a blood clot during thrombectomy and it's squeezed into a, into a, into a small catheter, that it doesn't recover its shape. It, it maintains its deformed shape when you remove it from the catheter. It doesn't spring back to its original deformation. So this is kind of like, this is, this is like plastic deformation, analogous to what we see for the stent. When we remove the balloon, the stent doesn't spring, spring back to its original shape. It's, it, the, the blood clot is doing something kind of similar. Uh, and there's some experimental data emerging to, to, uh, to suggest that this is the case. And this is, this is happening with a blood clot for a different reason to the stent. So stent is made from metal, and the reason metal deforms permanently is because of dislocation glide in the microstructure. Any material scientist in the audience will know about this. Of course, we don't have dislocations in, in, a, in a blood clot, but what we do have is, is the fiber network, which is lots of crosslinks. And we proposed a new model, which we, which we submitted to the special issue, where, where we say that the plasticity in the blood clot is as a result of the formation of new bonds between uh, fibers in the in the network in the fiber network, um, and as we as we deform the material, the, these strands of fiber come closer together. If, if we do a compaction, and these will form new bonds, which will in a sense give us a permanent deformation. When we then unload the material, these new bonds stay intact, and and the and network doesn't doesn't spring back to its original position. And the same if we try and compact the network, we're pushing all the all the fibers closer to each other, and we get the form we get to, we get formation of new cross bridge or cross links um, between different strands of fiber. So we've developed a thermodynamically based uh, model where we have a kinetic equation describing the rate of bond formation and the rate of bond breakage also. Um, and when we do this, and we uh, and we compare it to a, an experiment where a clot is stretched and then released, uh, and it doesn't go back to its original position, our model is giving a very good prediction of this. And one example of where this can be important is in simulating aspiration. Uh, so here are some initial uh, simulations of, of clot aspiration. This is an aspirator. We apply a pressure to an idealized rectangle or a cylindrical blood clot. And we can see that we're getting permanent deformation, particularly at these very high deformation regions towards the corner of the aspirator. So this, this changes our prediction of how, how much the clot goes into the tube. And also there's, there's evidence emerging that if you do a cyclic pressure, that you get a better result for aspiration. And we've checked that this is not the result of viscoplasticity or viscoelasticity, and it's not the result of friction. You know, we've checked these things. So the last remaining option is that it, possibly a result of permanent plastic deformation. It gradually emerges during, during a dynamic aspiration. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's an example of how we apply these, uh, these complicated plasticity models to soft tissue, and in particular, uh, to blood clots. Um, I'm just looking at the time. So I just, I think maybe, uh, 25 minutes past now. I think I'm supposed to take a break at, after one hour. Um, maybe now is a good time to take a five minute break, but uh, before, before I do, are there any questions on any of this or any feedback? Am I, am I going too quickly? Is it too boring for the engineers or is it too incomprehensible if you're not an engineer or any, any change of emphasis that you would like for the second half? Or any general remarks or questions? Uh, it looks like everybody is happy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so Ed, should I take a should I take a five minute break at this point, or? I think it's up to you, but I think it would be a good idea. Shall we do this five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay.
Uh, should I start again, Ed? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. I guess everybody's here. Okay. So, so in the in the first hour, I talked a lot about the material behavior. We focused a lot on this uh, on this D matrix, so this simple form for linear elastic materials, where we just need a Young's modulus to describe the behavior and the Poisson's ratio. Uh, to more complicated plastic deformation, where we need uh, a more complex uh, incremental solution of a nonlinear uh, stiffness matrix, uh, and similarly for nonlinear hyperelasticity. Uh, and moving on to fiber reinforced biological materials. And then we talked about the, the big challenge in including these fibers that we get in living materials that you know, makes the challenge of modeling this behavior quite difficult. Um, and we get, we get challenges that we don't get for traditional engineering materials like rubbers or, and so forth. So up to now, we've only talked about the material behavior, but, and, and, one thing we always you know, usually, what an engineer wants to know or a designer wants to know when he's doing a finite element analysis is not just how much the material will be formed under a certain load, but he wants, you know, usually wants to know how will, how will this uh, component break? How, how do things break? Or what's the limit of the loads that this, that this structure can carry? This is a very important question. I mean, here, we, here we're showing a, a common problem that you get with turbines, with wind turbines is they basically fracture of the turbine, which is catastrophic. These blades can sometimes be up to hundred meters long and it's, it's, uh, it's spectacular and catastrophic when we get fractures like this. But also in the medical device world, uh, fracture is important, uh, very important. Uh, and I'm showing an example here of, of some clinical imaging of stents that have undergone full fracture. You can see the stent is fractured right across this section here. Similarly here as well, you can see lots of these struts are broken. And, and also this is a hip replacement and that, that has completely fractured. And if you think about it, these are terrible events because you can't remove a stent. If a stent fractures, it, it, it's, um, <laughs> you can't reverse a stent deployment. So you can get a stent in with a balloon, but you can't, have, you can't ever get a stent out. And you know, with these hip replacements, once it fractures, it's a terribly messy job to get it out again because it's usually cemented or you know, attached to the femur. And it's, it's major surgery to remove, to remove this. So understanding how things break or fracture mechanics is, is very important. Uh, and one strategy that we use um, is a thing called cohesive zone modeling of fracture. And cohesive zone modeling of fracture is, is, is basically asking two questions. Basically, if we, if we start to deform a material, what's the amount of force that it takes to cause it a fracture? So in other words, what's the, I'm plotting here the, 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 the traction, which is like a measure of the force uh, at a crack in the material and the displacement, in other words, how much a crack in the material is opening. So first of all, what's the critical traction that will, that will cause the fracture to initiate? And then what's the area under this curve? And that's, that's basically a measure of the amount of energy it takes to, to fracture the material. So in other words, how much energy must be stored in the material before a crack will grow in, a, in an uncontrolled manner? So fracture is all about crack growth and cracks becoming Cracks getting into a regime where they grow in an uncontrolled manner. So we've developed lots of cohesive zones, um, some of which we've applied to blood clots and insist. And, and these cohesive zones basically involve definition of, of these maximum tractions and also the, the energy under the curve, uh, the, 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 the amount of energy it takes to perform the fracture. And, and another important aspect of fracture for biological materials is that the fracture is usually mode dependent. So in other words, if we try and perform a shear, we, we can get cracks growing in mode one, which is basically the crack surfaces get pulled apart like this, or we can 
we can fracture a material in shear where the cracked surfaces slide over each other. So those, those are two competing ways in which materials can fracture. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to show two examples of applications of fracture mechanics for biological materials. The first one is uh, some work that we've done and published recently on simulating aortic dissection. And this is somewhat related to, to I suppose, plot development. Um, so usually when in, in previous studies, um, well, first of all, what is aortic dissection? So aortic dissection, here you see a piece of aorta and you can see a crack in the aorta wall. And what often happens is this crack grows between different layers of the aorta. It grows between the, the intima and the media. And, and it can propagate over very, very long distances. So sometimes if you get a small crack starting in your aortic arch, just above your heart, this crack can grow in a very uncontrolled manner all the way down to your femoral arteries over distances that can be measured on the order of almost meters. You know, so these are very catastrophic uh, clinical events that are really driven by you know, mechanical crack propagation. And there's, there's a big drive right now to understand these propagations of cracks that we get in, in the aorta and in other vessels. Also, when we get dissections like this, also in the carotid, for example, um, and in lots of the peripheral vessels. The problem is, the problem with, with the state of research to date in terms of understanding aortic dissection is that the experiments that people do are typically peel tests. So this is a peel test. You take a piece of aorta, you, you basically make a small notch and you catch one part of the notch and you pull upwards and you catch another part and you pull downwards and you peel, you peel it apart like I'm showing in this final element simulation. So this is called a peel test. So we're, we're basically opening up a crack like this. And, and this is what we call a mode one crack because we're pulling the crack surface apart. It's, it's, it's what we call a normal opening. But if we simulate an aorta or any blood vessel, uh, as we're doing here, so what's the main mode of loading on a blood vessel? Well, it's, the main mode of loading is very high blood pressures, you know, 120 millimeters of mercury, maybe 200 millimeters of mercury of lumen pressure acting outwards onto the vessel wall. And what this means is that in the, in the radial direction, if I take the stress component in the radial direction here, it's under compression. So here I'm plotting the tractions, or in other words, the forces in the, in, at, along the plane between the intima and the media in the aorta. And if you look at this contour plot here, all the numbers are negative. It starts at, 3.4 e to the minus 2, and it goes up to mi minus 3.4 e to the minus 2, and it goes up to minus 3.7. That's telling me that in the radial direction, the aorta wall is entirely under compression everywhere. So this test is completely inappropriate because here we're putting tension between the two layers, and in the physiological loading, we have compression between the two layers. So that tells me that the crack should never grow in this manner in the body. So this kind of test that you see everywhere in the literature isn't so helpful. It's a little bit helpful, but not, not that appropriate for understanding this problem here. Why? Because this, you know, this, this, these two layers will never open up like this in the body. They're opened up like this, uh, in, this in this schematic here, but, but the crack will never start like this because the blood pressure is pushing these layers into each other. Um, so the second way that a crack can grow is through shear. And, and basically, what we do with a, with a shear test is we, we take the material and we, we basically move it in like this. So we're basically pulling the two layers apart by moving in, in the same plane as the crack. And this kind of test has been done for many materials, uh, polymers, composite materials for aerospace, um, metallic materials. And there have been some efforts to do this on arterial tissue. And this is, this is one from, uh, from Gerhard Halsefeld and Gerhard Summers. Uh, so basically you have a platen here, your artery is attached to the platen and this is moved horizontally. And the idea is that you grow this crack in the horizontal direction under shear. Now, the problem is when we simulate this, if you look very closely at the crack here, what's happening is we need to get a huge deformation of the artery before the crack starts. So if you, if you watch this carefully, when this crack starts, we're already at a 45 degree angle here. And then when we zoom in 
this is just at the start of the crack. When we zoom in on the crack tip, we actually see that we're getting a, a, a buckle at the crack tip. And in fact, this is not a shear test at all at the crack tip. If we look at the mode angle, what's called the mode angle, how much of this is pulling apart like this versus shearing like this, it's nearly entirely pulling apart like this. It's just this test, even though it's designed to be a shear test, because the material has to deform so much, because of, because of the toughness of the material, it has to deform so much before we grow the crack, that it ends up being essentially the same kind of test as this P test, which, as I said, is not useful for this problem. A different kind of shear test was tried by Victor Barakas, uh, who's done great work in arteries uh, over the years, but similar pro So in his test, he instead of attaching the top and bottom surface to a platen, he leaves them free so this can rotate. But we still, you can still see that this is not a shear. If you zoom in closely here, we get a normal opening here at, at the crack tip. So this is the this is the bottom experiment. It's almost entirely a normal. The, the top experiment is closer to pi over two is a shear test, and the top experiment is closer to a shear test, but not not nearly close enough. So we wanted to develop a new experimental methodology that will cause the fracture to happen entirely in shear. And why do we want to do that? Because we want to know how strong the material is at resisting the shear crack. Because we're convinced that in the body, in the aortic dissection, must start with a shear crack. So I had many years ago developed analytical solutions for, for um, the stress on a stent coating. And, and basically, in, in a stent, you have an arch region and, and, and a straight strut region. And we found in this analytical analysis of, of, of this kind of a structure that we get very high shears at the interface between a circular arch and a straight region. So we, we decided to try and apply this to the artery. So we cut a ring of artery like this and attach it to two loading bars and stretch it like this, make it stretch from this circular configuration to this configuration. And our, our hypothesis is, is that in this region up here, where we transition from a circular part to a straight part, that we should get a very high shear. So this is what our final helmet model is telling us. We should get a very high shear here. And if the material is sufficiently tough to resist radial crack propagation, then we hope that this test should give us a mode two crack. In other words, that the crack would not grow through the thickness of the artery and cause a fracture, but it would grow between the layers of the artery. So, so, this, so this is our, so, so we checked out the hypothesis using some cohesive zone modeling. Uh, and basically what we do is we cut a notch here uh, and we stretch and we hope we, according to our hypothesis, that you know, the, the crack should not follow the notch, but should it, it should kink and grow between the layers. And the reason we think that the crack won't follow the notch is because our simulation says that in an artery, all these collagen fibers are in the plane, in the circumferential direction, in, in the, in the, basically in the circumferential axial plane. And when we stretch the artery, these fibers become aligned in front of the crack tip like this. So we, we go from this alignment of fibers, we stretch the artery, and these fibers become very aligned behind this crack tip. And when these arteries become aligned behind the crack tip, it means that it becomes harder to fracture them. So think about any fibrous material. It's very hard to grow crack through the fibers. The crack will more happily grow. It's easier to grow the crack between the fibers or along the fibers, but not through the fibers because it takes too much energy. So this is a toppling mechanism. And our, our, if we look at the J integral, the J integral is, is, is basically very high due to this for, for radial crack propagation compared to propagation in, in the shear direction. So the change will is like a measure of the, you know, the energy at fraction, in a sense too. Um, so this is what our final element model predicts. Here's time zero, the, the crack is up here, and then it propagates. And instead of growing through the thickness, you can see the crack is growing along the artery. It looks like it's only growing a small bit from here to here, but in fact, it's grown all the way to here. It just doesn't look like this is a crack because the flap is, it's, it's only growing in shear. So the two, the two sides of the crack stay in contact, but the traction is, is zero. So the crack has essentially grown as far as here. 
And our predicted mode angle here is pure mode two. It's right on pi over two. So this is a, if this test works, we believe that we will have developed a fracture test that gives us a pure mode two fracture of an artery, which basically, which you fail to get from this test, from a lap shear test, from this test or from this test. So we did some you know, design of experiment. We had to make sure the loading bars are strong enough to carry the force required to get up to the critical strength because these arteries are very tough. It takes a lot of force. You have to deform them a lot before they, before they rip. This is an artery taken from a, from a sheep. Um, this, blue, this blue line is where, where it's marking the crack. Okay, so this is the experimental results. Uh, I think this should be a video, I hope. Yes, okay, so you can see the crack is growing along the circumferential direction of the artery. So it's a pure shear crack. You can see it moving along here. In fact, the crack tip is down here. You don't see any normal opening. It's, it's entirely a pure shear crack. Um, and then you finally get a fracture. Um, let's play that video one more time. So here you see an initiation and then a pure shear crack. So even though we cut the notch in the radial direction, the crack, the crack would not grow in the radial direction. The crack is turning and growing in this direction. And this is the, so we measure the force and the circumferential strain in the artery. And this is the point of initiation. And eventually this is the final fracture. And this was very repeatable. We did, I think, 15 tests and we got the exact same pattern every time. Every single time we got, we got a shear crack. And we were able to measure the crack length as a function of the, um, as a function of the strain energy that we're putting into the, into the artery. And again, we got pretty good repeatability considering this is a biological material. And in order to calibrate, in order to figure out the strength, the, the sheer strength of the, of the artery, we, we basically had to perform this cohesion zone modeling. So this is our simulation of the experiment. And you can see that this looks, our simulation looks very much like the this is a video here. Our simulation looks very much like the, like the movie I just showed of the experiment. The crack is growing along the circumferential direction. So you can see it, you can see it here more clearly in these, in these images here. And what we found is that the, the, the shear strength is about 1.6 megapascals. And this is in fact eight times higher than the strength that you get from a peel test. So this, this test that everybody else is doing which is the wrong test, is saying that the artery is eight times weaker than it really is. Because the true strength is the sheer strength. That's the only strength that matters in this situation. And it, it's, it's incredibly strong. Okay. So then we were able to fully develop our mixed mode quiz zone model. And we use this then to perform some patient specific analyses of, of dissection. So here we're, we're showing dissection patterns in the artery. We can see, we're, we get dissections up near the bifurcations at the carotids. Also, we can often get dissections starting at the renals. And in, in these ideal, we did a full parametric study and we found that a dissection is more likely to initiate in the arch region and to propagate distally from the arch. I think there's good clinical evidence that this is the case. So this black region here is where the crack propagates. It starts as a small crack and then you can see we get very, very large amounts of crack propagation over long distances which is similar to what's seen experimentally. Okay. So we continue this work and insist by, uh, so you've seen some of, some of Beruza's fracture of blood clots. So to try and use the same logic, and the same modeling for blood clots, Beruza performed these in collaboration with, with Ray and Danu. In Naravi, we performed these CT fracture tests. So basically we start off with a blood clot with a crack and you can see that this crack is growing as we stretch the material. But we have to stretch it a lot before the crack is grown. And the reason again is we feel because the fiber network is becoming a line in front of the crack tip and making it very hard. You see the crack becomes blunt, uh, rounded before, before it will grow. So this is the indication of a of material that, that really is resistant to fracture. And we found that the more fiber in the clot the more energy it takes to fracture the clot. In other words, the, the crack is more resistant to fracture if the fibrin content is high. 
So if the hematocrit is low, the hematocrit of the blood solution that we use to make the clot is low, then we have a high fibrin content and we have a high fracture toughness. Whereas if we have a high hematocrit, that means we have a low fibrin content and it's much easier to, to cause the crack, the, the clot to fracture. So we perform very detailed analysis of uh, the material behavior of the clot because in order to do a good fracture analysis, you must know how much energy is being stored in the material. And this is our final element analysis with a quiescent zone of the propagation of the of the clot, or the propagation of the of the crack in the clot. And we're able to get a very good match with the experimental data as a function of the fiber and content. And again, our final element model is telling us that we're getting big alignments of the fiber and network just behind the crack tip, which is giving us a, a high degree of toughness. So we then work with, um, with Jose and Francesco and Julia and Sarah to perform some simulations of cracking in the clot during thrombectomy. So Julia gave us some of her thrombectomy simulations and we applied the boundary conditions from the thrombectomy device uh, to the clot. And we predict some small amount of crack growth on the surface of the clot but not, not a full fracture because the thrombectomy device is causing a big compression in the clot, which is stopping the crack growing over a long distance. So we're, we're getting some small amount of material being removed from the surface or some small amount of cracking on the surface of the clot, which will lead to removal of small amounts of material, but not, not a full fracture in, the, in this particular case in any event. Um, so we were, you know, we're delighted to be able to apply our, our findings to the thrombectomy simulations, even though the results are very preliminary. And uh, we next hope to apply this fracture mechanics modeling to the simulation of aspiration, because we feel there's a high risk of fracture during the aspiration event, uh, where the clot is trying to um, change its shape a lot to squeeze into the aspirator. And we feel that this will cause a, an initiation of fracture. OK, so maybe that's a, that's a good place to stop. I think I'm just, just out of time. and. Uh, it's good to stop on these familiar pictures that you'll have seen in our various assist presentations over the last 12 months. So, uh, so happy to take any questions. i not sure if this was too simple or too complicated or both too simple and too complicated at the same time, maybe a bit of both. Okay, thanks, Beth. Any questions? If, if I may start uh, about uh, this this first this section uh, and and it's 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 a remarkable image. It's beautiful to see this this section thing, uh, but but in reality the, the load is by is by pressure. So the pressure would act on the total surface and not very locally at one point. So uh, I missed how this then develops in in a normal in vivo situation. So do, do you mean this last very last image here? Yeah, the 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 the, the, the vessel dissection image that you showed with the, the very local. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So, so you can see that the deform shape is is very complicated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the deform shape is entirely due to due to the interaction between the thrombectomy device and the clot. And the thrombectomy device consists of you know these discrete struts which are only contacting the clot in very localized regions. So. Uh, the whole clot is being deformed by the thrombectomy device, but obviously directly underneath the struts, we will get slightly higher deformations. And that's where, this, that's where we get stress localizations. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so that's why we're getting these small fractures directly under the struts, but not through the whole thickness. Okay, of it. Yeah. yeah. Because the, uh, in a macro sense, the thrombectomy device, is, you're absolutely correct. The thrombectomy device is putting the whole clot under compression. And if we look at the stress state here, uh, it's all blue, so it's negative. So the max principal stress is negative. So it means the whole, the whole of nearly all of this cross section, this is a cross section AA, nearly all of this cross section is in compression. So like I said, the cracks, the clots, the, the crack is not going to grow in a compression. Uh, so, but, but, even though the vast majority of the cross section is under compression, we can get small regions of tension just because of the complex interaction between the night and ultra device with its complicated strut design and the surface of the clock. 
So that's where we think you can get small fractures and maybe small emboli formation. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. So question that I have. So <clears throat> there's a lot going on. Thanks, by the way. It was really, really illustrative. Uh, be nice to see all the other examples and the theory behind it. But if you got a new task, what takes up the most time? Is it creating a model, taking, making a computer model? Uh, so what takes the most time of your job as an uh, <laughs> engineer working in this field? Yeah, I think I think it's it's a really good question, Hank. Experimental input is really important. Um, and as materials become more complicated, you need more mm -hmm. experiments. So if you if you have a simple engineering material that's well characterized, like stainless steel or piece of polymer, usually one test is enough. Yeah, you know, uniaxial tension test. You, you know, if it's a if it's only a small deformation, you just need the Young's modulus. You can trivially get this. If it's hyperelastic, you just need to stretch it over a longer distance. But for for materials like cloths, you need to. We, you know, we're finding it's not enough just to do a compression test, but we now have to think about also doing a tension test because the behavior is different in tension and compression because the fiber the fiber network is probably buckling in compression, but, but stretching a lot in tension. Then shear is important. Um, so we, we need to think about maybe doing shear tests. Uh, here I've only done a, a mode one fracture test, but we're now thinking about doing a mode two fracture test if it's possible. Um, so when materials become complicated, you have to do more than one test. You know, I always say, you know, be very, you know, the expression of, you know, be, be wary, be careful of a man who's only read one book or who only owns one book. But you know, I, I would say to my students, you know, be careful of you know, the engineer who's only done one test on this piece of material. Um, right. So that's where, that's where a lot of time goes. But then the second huge investment of time is understanding the physics and then trying to convert this understanding of the physics into a new set of differential equations that describes the material behavior. That's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. You have to think of numerical schemes to solve these equations because you can't solve them with, with pen and paper. So that's why we use finite elements. So you have to find numerical schemes to basically solve these equations inside a finite element course. So you have to write a program to describe your new equations and solve them in a, in a numerical way interfacing them with a final element solver uh, and really that's that's a massive amount of time and you run into kinds of computational problems uh, yeah so usually when I see someone who's done work developing a new material model I, I immediately know that that took you know almost a full PhD just to make that one material model and it sometimes is underappreciated if, you, if people aren't working in the field they kind of like oh it's the same pretty pictures you get if you do a simple linear elastic analysis. You know, that may the, the pictures might look similar, but the the richness of the physics is completely different, and the level of understanding you get is completely different. And so, you know, most of the logical materials, it's just usually incorrect to use the established material models that are already in the finite element solvers because. Final elements, none of the, final, the commercial final element solvers are really developed properly for biological materials. Uh, so the, the correct material options are not there. So you have to write your own program and interface that with, with the solver. And this, this, is, this is a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's multifaceted. I think it's, it's, you can't really do the material law development without good experimental input. So either you got to do your own experiments or work with good experimental people or both, preferably. Um, and it's not enough to just understand the physics and be able to write down the governing equations, but you must be skilled in numerical analysis techniques so you can solve the equations in a, in a, in a I suppose, a practical way in the context of a fine element program. So it's-, it's well, What time span are you talking about? Is this, uh... Is it hours or weeks uh, for a typical experiment to calculate for sulfur? Oh, for, for the actual simulation. Once you've done all that work and you want to just do a simulation. Um, oh, well, yeah. the complexity of the simulation. So for this, this fracture simulation that you're looking at here, which is just a simple, simple enough crack growing through this. Uh, I think Beru's maybe takes maybe four or five hours to, to solve this. 
it, it's slow. You see, you, as you as the crack grows, you're releasing a lot of energy from the material. Um, yeah. So that makes the you know, that that makes this the solver quite slow. Um, you need a lot of a lot of increments, a lot of steps to get to this. Um, so this is like maybe a four or five hour simulation. Uh, Julia's simulations you know, are monstrous. Uh, she does her full trans. I mean, you know all those beautiful movies that she shows you. You know, I I shouldn't speak for Julia, but I think those those simulations are typically twenty six hours or something like that on on several. Yeah, yeah. Because there's you know, geometry is so complex and so there's so much contact. So so really, you know, once you do the once you do the experiments and you understand the physics and you write your new material model, how long a simulation depends on you know how complicated the geometry is. If you if you're just modeling. Yeah. A simple clock fracture experiment, it's yeah, yeah. nothing crazy. But if you're modeling, you know, like the patient-specific arteries that we've been developing with the thrombectomy device, it's really pushing it to the limit. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which is advancing the state of the art, which, which is one of the important contributions we're making in CIST, I think. It's, you know, uh, I think what the guys in Milano have done in terms of advancing what's possible in terms of really simulating the, you know, the interaction between thrombectomy device and a clot inside a real patient's artery model. It's just uh, really advancing the state of the art of in silico medicine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Any other questions? Sure. Jose? I'm going to ask a question because you are, are unmuted. No, no, I'm just, uh, I was okay. just listening. No, 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 that's fine. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it's six o'clock. It has been six o'clock. So I'd like to thank uh, Pat very much. Uh, it's complex material for uh, I guess uh, uh, some of us, but I think we learn from this a lot. Uh, uh, even though it'll be very hard for some of us to to really uh, apply this, but it's good to know what the possibilities are and and what the challenges are, of course, in this uh, these techniques. So yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's a uh, you know working on insist is fantastic because we're all pushed outside our comfort zone. So oh, yes. you know, this, this is, you know, I, I present this as complex, but, you know, yeah. people like me who work in this field, you know, we understand it, but we have massive challenges understanding, you know, the clinical aspects and, uh, you know, so I think the big challenge in assist is for all of us to try and communicate our expertise so that other people can at least get a working understanding and use it, use it in their work. I think, you know, certainly I, I benefited hugely from working from all the non-engineering partners and insist it's been it's been fantastic. So I, 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 I think here is that. basically convey the complexity and hopefully maybe some kind of appreciation. Okay, wise words. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody, and see you uh, next time then. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you. Ciao.